Son and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Respected fathers, brothers and sisters in Christ, in the name of our Lord, I would like to extend my greetings. Today, we'll have our sermon with the title, He that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. He that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. It is God that teaches. It is God that rebukes. Let it be his will for all of you who is listening to this sermon right now, so that you bear 30 folds, 60 folds, and 100 folds. And the prayer and intercession of our mother, St. Mary, be with us all. Amen. Our title for the sermon is He that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit had to say. We find this in the book of Revelation. As we all know, the book of Revelation is written by our father, the Apostle St. John. St. John the Beloved, he was exiled into this remote island after the resurrection and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our fathers tell us that St. John lived his life in this remote island, remembering and thinking of his suffering, Christ's suffering, and Christ's temptation that he went through for every one of us. Our fathers tell us he lived the rest of his life remembering and actually reliving the pain. He lived his life crying nonstop. And as we also know that St. John the Apostle did not die but God took him. But towards the end, God revealed this deep mystery to him. And this revelation is what we find in the book of Revelation. This revelation is what Saint John the Apostle, the beloved, received from God. If we read Revelation chapter 2 and 3, We will see the seven different letters and epistles God sent to the seven different churches at the time. Before starting these epistles or letters, and right before ending them, God said, He that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. Hence, we get our title. We'll try to see what each epistle has in it for that specific church, for that specific bishop at the time. And we'll focus on one particular epistle or letter and we'll do our sermon or teaching on that specific letter. So if we start reading the book of Revelation chapter 2 verse 4, we find the first epistle. The first letter was sent to the church that is found in Ephesus. So one thing to remember, whenever we read these letters, it says or the, the letter actually claims that it is, it is sent 
to the angel of that church at that time the angel representing the bishops but right now we take each letter as if it's written for every single one of us today Revelation chapter 2 verse 4 says this nevertheless I have something against you because you have left your first love so this is sent to the church that is found in, in Ephesus to the bishop at that time or the church at that time for the people of the, 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 the Ephesians the Ephesians or the people of Ephesus God said I have something against you because you have left your first love whenever God sends these letters to this each church he tells them the problem he also tells them the solution and at the same time the reward so this is the problem and this is how you fix it and if you actually do fix it then this is what I will be giving you so for this church in Ephesus God told him God told the church the people the bishop at the time that they actually left their first love meaning when they accepted Christ when they accepted the New Testament when they accepted or believed in God they loved God see they did everything out of love they prayed out of love they gave out of love they fasted because they loved God but when time goes by they actually forgot their first love so their love decreased so if you find yourself in the same situation then read this specific letter if you find yourself decreasing in love towards God then read the specific letter this is the letter that is sent to Ephesus the church in Ephesus the second one was sent to the church that is found in Samaria and it is found in Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 and it says this fear none of those things which you shall suffer for behold the devil shall cast some of you into prison that all you may be tired or tried and all and all of you shall have tribulations be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life so this church this church got the letter and the message of not fearing because at the time they did actually fear of death they actually feared of problems that may arise from every other people that are surrounding them that are not Christian or the devil himself and God told them be faithful be strong don't be afraid and I'll give you the crown of life the third message is found in Revelation chapter 2 verse 14 and it says this but I have a few things against you because you have there that hold the doctrines of Balaam who taught Balaam to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication so this is another thing we see in Revelation this is the third letter that is sent to this this church they committed fornication not only that they ate from things that are sacrificed unto the idols the fourth letter is found on Revelation chapter 2 verse 20 and 
God had message or God rebuked them because they actually deviated from the discipline of the religion. They had women who think they could prophesy or they had women who think they are prophets and they seduce the servants of the church and they commit fornication and they also ate from things that are sacrificed onto idols and this is another thing that God blamed them for the fifth church that is found in that that is found in Sardis in Revelation chapter 3 verse 1 it says this I know your work that you have a name that you are alive but you are actually dead that you have a name that you are alive but you are actually dead so these are people that actually thought they were alive meaning they actually thought they were okay but at the end they were dead right so god could not find religion in them god could not find faith in them god could not find trustworthiness in them therefore he blamed them for that okay and the sixth message was sent to the church that is found in philadelphia okay and it says this revelation chapter 3 verse 11 behold i am coming quickly hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown okay and he told him i will be coming very quickly so hold fast of the faith don't change it with anything and i will give you your crown so be ready don't lose faith don't say that i'm not coming but i will be coming very quickly okay and the last message was sent to a church found in Laodicean, right and we will actually be focusing on this specific message to this specific church and we'll try to see what it means for that specific church and also how we can apply this letter and this message onto our own life okay and i'll try to read the whole message and this is found in revelation chapter 3 verse 15 to 22 and it says this and to the angel of the church of Laodicean, write this thing say this this things says the amen the faithful and the true witness the beginning of creation of god i know your work that you are neither cold nor hot i could wish you were cold or hot so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot i will vomit you out of my mouth because you say i am rich and have become wealthy and have no need of anything and do not know that you are actually wretched miserable poor blind and naked i counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that you shall i'm not sorry that the shame of your nakedness may be not revealed and anoint your eyes with eyes saves that you may see as many as i love i rebuke and chastise therefore be zealous and repent behold i stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door i will come into him and dine with him and he with me to him who overcomes this i will grant to sit with me 
on my throne, and as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. He that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. So from this point on, we'll try to see and we'll try to, to actually dissect and understand what the letter is about. And we'll try to see in different parts. We'll try to divide the letter into different parts and see and understand what the whole message is about. Okay. So the first thing we need to understand is who actually sent this message. So we know and we have been claiming that God actually sent this message through his beloved, the Apostle St. John, to this specific church. However, it says, when the letter starts, it says, This thing says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. So what does this mean? We actually have to understand. So therefore, we'll try to see what the Amen is, what the faithful and true witness is, and what the beginning of creation of God is. Okay? So, what does it mean by the Amen? So, if you read John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. This is written in the New, God, in the New Testament, the Gospel of John. Before Abraham was, I am. So, Christ is telling them. So, the disciples saw him as a human, walking on earth, eating like they eat, talking like they talk. And at the same time, he was trying to teach them something above the fleshly, above the worldly thing, right? So he's telling them, I existed. I was before Abraham was even created, right? So before Abraham was, I am. Can you see how he puts Abraham in the old, uh, in the past sentence, in the past tense, and how he put himself when he talks about him himself, how he puts it in the present tense? Because God never, there was no time God never existed on, right? So time does not limit God, okay? Time is a creation, and God is the creator, right? So time is created by God. So therefore, God is outside of time. Therefore, before Abraham was in the past tense, I am so I have always existed and there is no starting time for God and there's no ending time for God so that's what he's trying to tell them and right here when John wrote the letter the reason he said amen is because he's trying to tell us that it is God that actually said this message or sent this message okay the same the same message is given in the Old Testament too if you read Ex Exodus chapter 3 verse 14 and God said to Moses I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall tell the children of Israel, I am has sent me. I am has sent me. So he refers to himself as I am because nothing else could describe him. God is God. God is God. Okay, there is no other description for God. God in his essence is beyond our understanding. Is beyond our imagination. It's beyond our heads and minds combined together. So God is God. Therefore, he says, I am who I am. And then he said, before Abraham was, I am. So by God claiming that he is what he is and by saying, I am what I am, we know God existed before time and there's no limit to God. Okay, God is not limited in space and God is not limited in time. Therefore, when we see the Amen, we know it is God. The Amen is trying to refer to God. The Amen. God. Okay? So, it says, this thing says the Amen. So now we're talking about God, okay, this thing says the Amen, but not only that, it also says the faithful and true witness. So 
So the faithful and true witness. So what are we trying to? So what is what is what is he trying to say here? What does he mean by the faithful and true witness? So if you read John chapter sixteen verse thirteen, it says, "Whoever was, I'm sorry. However, when he, the Spirit of Truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak unto his own authority, but." Whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. So now this is Christ telling his disciples about the Holy Spirit, because the disciples were scared, right? This is when the time come. This is when when he told them that he would die and he would leave them, right? He would die, he would resurrect, and then he would ascend, and he would leave them by themselves. But at the same time, he told them, "I will go, but I'll also send you the Spirit of Truth," right? So the spirit of truth is the Holy Spirit. Once you have the Holy Spirit, then He will tell you of the truth. He will teach you of the truth. Okay. So the second part, this thing says the Amen, and then also says this thing says the Amen and the faithful and the true witness. So the faithful and the true witness is describing the Holy Spirit. Okay. And then it says. The beginning of creation of God. So when people actually read this part, they say Christ is created. No, we don't say that. Okay, that by itself is heresy, right? We don't say Christ is actually created because Christ is God, and God is never created. Okay, God always existed, but we say Christ is born from the Father and from Saint Mary. Okay, so when he says the beginning of creation of God, he's talking about himself. Okay, remember when we read John one, one to three, right? John one one, it says, "In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made." So he's telling us. The word was with God. The word is God, okay, and the word created everything, right? So, he's telling us this: the word is the starter of creation. So, the word is the one that created. So, he is the beginning when it comes to creation. Okay, God is the only creator, right? Therefore, when he describes God in the phrase "the word," he's talking about the word as the creator. Okay. That is why he says, "The beginning of creation, the beginning of creating creation." Okay. So now, the Amen, the true and faithful witness, and the Word, or the beginning of creation of God. Okay. So these three things describe the Holy Trinity. The Amen describes the Father. Right. The true and faithful witness describes the Holy Spirit. And the creation, the beginning of creation of God, describes the Word of Jesus Christ. Therefore, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit says this, and it goes into the the actual message, right? So this is this is what, uh, so this is God actually sending the message. Okay. So now we know who actually sent it. So instead of actually focusing on the problem and how to solve it, then we'll try to see. Now we'll try to see the reward. Okay, the reward. Remember, I told you, right? So when God sent sends this message, He sends them. He sent He sent the message into into this this particular uh, outline. He would describe the problem and He would give the solution, and also He would tell the reward. Right. Now we'll try to focus on the reward. Okay. So the reward is found in Revelation chapter three verse twenty-one at the end, and it says this: "To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne." Okay. So the second part of the sentence, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Okay. When you read this. When you read this, 
you have to sup- you have to be super super careful because God is not saying or Christ is not saying I got to sit down with my father because I overcame right there's no causation okay it's not because he overcame that he got to sit down with his father on the throne okay so God the son is equal to God the father when it comes to authority when it comes to power when it comes to creation when it comes to divinity and godliness right so therefore we don't say there is no time where the son was less than the father right therefore it means when he says i overcame and sat down with my father we should be careful because it is very 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 likely to just interpret it or understand it as i overcame and then I got to sit down with my father. But that's not the case, okay? So Jesus Christ overcame, meaning he overcame the power of death, right? He won the devil. So now God is victorious. Christ is victorious over the devil. So there's no time, there's no time that, that God was never never victorious over the devil. But we're trying to focus on Christ on earth, right? Christ died. Christ um, was buried as, as every human does, right? But because he went through all of the, those things, he overcame and he won. So we're talking about his life on earth, okay? Remember, remember, Christ was exactly the same in his humanity. He's exactly the same as every one of us today, right? He's exactly the same as every one of us today. But in his divinity, he is equal to the Father and to the Holy Spirit, okay? So he resembled us fully, 100%. Humanity side, Christ resembled us 100%, okay? In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 and 15, it says this, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all point tempted as we are, yet without sin. See, God, Christ, resemble, uh, resembled us in, in his humanity 100% except for sin. Right? So he is clean and he has been clean and he is also clean always. Without sin and except for sin, he was like us. He suffered through problems. He went through problems. He went to temptations as every human does today. Right. So now when he says, I overcame, he's trying to tell us the flesh overcame. The flesh won. Humanity is no, no more cast it down so humanity is no more to the devil but humanity overcame christ elevated humanity that's what he's talking that's what he's telling us here okay when he says i overcame he's telling us humanity overcame because of god himself okay and then he says so whoever who i'm sorry, I'm sorry who whoever would overcome this problems that described that was described into the onto the letters then I would reward him. I would reward him in the heavens. Okay? So that is the reward. And that is what we would receive if we actually understand the problem and focus on their solution and overcome. Okay? So now we'll try to see the actual problem and the solution. So if we start reading Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. It says this, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So I wish you were cold or hot. So what does this mean to be, to be hot or to be cold? Don't they seem to, don't they seem to, to opposite things, right? Hot and cold. I mean, why does God want us to be either cold 
or hot? I mean, how can we make sense of this, right? We'll try to see what it means to be hot and what it means to be cold, okay? And then we'll try to see where we can put ourselves, hotness or coldness, okay? So we'll try, we'll, let's talk about hotness, I guess. So if you read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, it says, For our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. Hotness and fire, right? Hotness and fire. Those two things you can never, you, you can never, you can never take them out. I mean, you can never separate them. If we talk about fire, inevitably you're talking about hotness because one of the properties or the essence of fire is hotness, right? And it says in Hebrews 12, 29, God is fire. God is a consuming fire. Okay? So I'll, let me try to describe what it means to be hot. So I'll try to give you an example. Let's say it's a winter time, right? It's cold outside. It's snowing outside. But if you see, if you see fire burning like one mile away from you, you can see the light, right? It's nighttime, so you can see the light, but it's cold outside. You see the light, but it does not mean you can feel the heat because you are super far away, right? But the closer you get to the fire, the more you feel the heat. The closer you get to the fire, the more you the more you feel the heat. Okay, if we say God is like fire, then whoever is close to God would feel the heat. Not only that, would could could actually benefit from the heat because it's it's cold outside, right? Now you can survive this coldness because of the fire. So the more you get close to the fire itself, the more you get hotter. Okay, so let's say. You are super close to the fire for, for some time, right? And you come back home. So a person touching your body will feel the heat because your body is hot. Your body consumed heat from the fire, right? So those are the saints. The saints are close to God. That's why we see the saints doing miracles. That's why we see the saints doing miracles because they are close to God and they benefit from his godliness, but they benefit from his divinity, then they could do miracles. You can feel the heat of the fire through their body or through their saintlyhood, right? So the saints are the hot. So God is telling us, I wish you were like I wish you were hot. Meaning, I wish you were like the, the, the saints. So what do we mean by the saints? The saints are zealous, you know? The saints never, never get tired. They do get tired, but they will never stop. They will wake up at the middle of the night to pray. They will fast 24-7, right? They will make their bodies go through sufferings for the sake of getting close to God and for the sake of benefiting from His love and His divinity because they love Him so much. They love Him so much they endure pain. They endure temptation. Right? They live in the deserts. They live away from the world or civilization. Because they love God so much, they would take any pain over, over losing God. Right? So, the saints are referred with this hotness. Okay? So God is saying, I wish you were like the saints. I wish you loved me so much that you are zealous, that you would not stop, that you would you would you would do anything for the sake of being with me, right? That is what God tell, is telling us. I wish you were hot. But he didn't stop there. And he gave us the other option too, right? Cold. So what does it mean to be cold? So now we say the hot are the saints. Now what is the cold? What is the cold? So let's let's try to understand what that is. So for today, we'll conclude our teachings right here. And next time, we'll continue from here. Glory to the Father, glory to the Son, and glory to the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen.
Good. 